Hello, everybody, and uh, good morning. Good evening to everyone in Melbourne and other parts of um, Australia and uh, the countries where it's already late. Good day. Hello to everyone. I'm Lucy Masebi. I'm in East Jerusalem, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, wonderful sounding webinar on peace intelligence, a call to care, which is being organized by the Global Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict. It is the third in a series of webinars organized by our working group member, Selma. And we have been pioneering webinars for the last three years. GPAC is a global organization with a network across the world founded in 2003, but with a major meeting in New York in 2005. And it's a really working at the level of civil society and empowerment and uh, skill building, awareness raising for peace building and prevention throughout the world at a, at a local level. And so we are very proud of our work with GPAC, which promotes a global shift in peace building how armed conflict is dealt with from reaction to prevention. In particular, th this shows here, this slide shows some of the regions. 15, we have Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Middle East, which is where I'm based. And um, we link the working uh, regions, not only through regional groups, but also through working groups. And this webinar is organized by the Improving Practice Working Group, which I'm the chair of. And we really try to work on ways to improve how conflict is addressed or how wars are addressed and how people can build, build peace. And uh, this means developing toolkits, holding workshops, holding webinars. And we base everything, particularly on the principle of human security and on an inclusive and multi-stakeholder approach. This series of webinars, I think this is the last this year, is really trying to explore and take uh, the concept of peace building further than others have taken it. We are really pioneering what we can through this working group also. Um, I think there's one more slide, yes, just showing, showing in the days when we could travel, we used to meet face to face. And this shows our working group two years ago in Vienna. You can see we are a diverse group from all over the globe. And once again, I'm really delighted to welcome you to this exciting webinar, which will be given by Elaine Prattley. And now I turn over to my friend and colleague, Selma Youssef, to introduce Elaine. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Selma, for inviting Elaine. And thank you, most of all, Elaine, for, for coming and uh, inspiring us today. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are today. My name is Salma Yusuf, and I am speaking to you from Sri Lanka. I'm an Improving Practice Working Group member, and our activities were described by Lucy. So today we are dealing with a very interesting topic and a very interesting subject. To begin with, I will introduce our speaker for today, Elaine Prattley. Elaine is a Rotary Peace Fellow, Partnerships Facilitator, who speaks on culture, everyday peace building and conflict resolution. She developed a practice in peace building during her years representing the New Zealand government as a Crown Prosecutor, negotiating multilateral agreements for the New Zealand government, um, for the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, New Zealand Agency for International Development, and managing international law teams for China's biggest law firm, and co-founding a Beijing-based corporate agency she is currently completing a PhD at the University of Melbourne on youth peace building through food and is co-chair of the Global Peace Conference. 
I will now briefly introduce to you the topic for today. People are different, cultures are different. No two people are the same and no two conflicts are the same. How are peace practitioners to remain relevant and do no harm if this is always going to be the case? Most organizations turn to cultural competency training to remain relevant in our ever increasingly connected world. But Elaine asks us the question today, <coughs> is this enough? In this webinar, Elaine Prattley, Rotary Peace Fellow and Cultural Intelligence Trainer will draw on her insights on cultural intelligence to explore how we might cultivate what she calls a peace intelligence that is responsive enough to each new context. For Elaine, peace intelligence like cultural intelligence ultimately comes from a posture of care that sees the human in others. The session is going to be fun. It's going to be drawing on her joys and cultural faux pas while living and working in Malaysia, Switzerland, China, New Zealand, Australia, Kazakhstan, India, and Thailand. And is a call for peace practitioners to be gracious with others and also themselves as we live in a world full of unknowns. It is my pleasure to call upon Elaine Prattley to address the gathering. Elaine, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a, a wonderful opportunity to be with you today. And thank you, Sama, for inviting me. Um, let me just uh, share with you my screen. So before I uh, begin, I want to begin this session by telling you a story. This story is set in 1944 in North Borneo, in what is now known as Sabah in East Malaysia. For those of you who are not familiar with Malaysia, this, this is just a, a part of Malaysia. And right here, this is a, a map of the uh, Malaysia 1940s. And this is the British North Borneo. And this is where my story is set. This is now called Sabah. But at that time, it was North or Northern Borneo. So in, in 1944, or two years before 1944, in January the 3rd, 1942, uh, the Japanese for forces had landed and invaded North Borneo and occupied much of the land as part of the Japanese empire. Both the, the British community residing there and the Malay, Chinese, indigenous locals were compelled to give into the brutality of the Japanese. As a result, there was mass migration from coastal towns as people fled into the deep interior jungles seeking food. Well, at around this time, Chinese-Japanese relations were at an all-time low following the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, the capturing of Beijing, Shanghai, the rape of Nanjing in 1937. Because of Chinese resistance of the Japanese occupation in mainland China, the Chinese and indigenous people in North Borneo were severely repressed, prompting the birth of a local resistance movement called the Kinabalu guerrillas. So with this birth of this resistance movement, um, between October 1943 and January 1944, a small group of resistant fighters armed with just three pistols, a few grenades, and small knives and spears succeeded in killing around 50 to 90 Japanese soldiers in what is called the Jesselton Uprising. The Japanese army retaliated by summarily executing civilians until the leader of the revolt, Albert Kwok, you see his photo here, until Albert Kwok finally surrendered. Albert Kwok, along with some 175 people who had little to do, in fact, with the Jesselton uprising, were executed on 21st January 1944. Set in this context, only months later in 1944, a four-year-old boy was dying from rabies on some dirt road in, in North Borneo. Two years earlier, when the Allied forces were bombing Sandakan Airport, which was controlled by the Japanese, this boy's family had lost two of his baby sisters in their hurry to escape from the bombings. The boy did not fully understand the, the politics of what was happening around him, 
but he knew enough not to trust the Japanese. As he lay dying on the roadside, a man dressed in white, riding on a bicycle, stopped to look at this boy. This man was not only a medic, but a Japanese soldier. Being moved by the deplorable state of this severely malnourished boy, the soldier took this boy to his clinic, dressed this boy's head and facial wounds, and most memorable for this little boy, shared his fried fish lunch. This was the first protein that this severely malnourished boy had had in four years. And so unsurprisingly, this Jap Japanese man's generosity was a life changing gesture of care. This soldier took the boy home and visited this boy a few times to ensure, ensure the boy was recovering. But very soon after, the boy never saw this Japanese soldier ever again. The Japanese surrendered in Northern Borneo on 9 September 1945. So only a few months after this boy's encounter with the soldier. Now fast forward 60 years, and this boy is now a professor of architecture and an influential man in uh, his local city politics. Over the course of 16 years, this boy has hosted over 2,000 students from Japan's Waseda University at his home. Sharing the story of his encounter with this Japanese soldier and, the, uh, and this, uh, this act of care through this fish, encouraging these young students to lead a life based on compassion and service to others. Now, this boy is now an 80-year-old man, and I call this man, Francis Wong, my father-in-law. There are many, many stories around Asia like his, but I wanted to tell this story to you for a few reasons. Firstly, this Japanese man did something truly radical, especially in the context of war, where no doubt he would have known many Japanese soldiers killed in the Jesselton uprising. I wonder what resistance and perhaps disapproval from his fierce peers he might have run up against if his peers saw him helping this, this enemy, this, even though a boy, the enemy, um, uh, I mean, in terms of this boy's family, I, I only wonder what he must have run up against. Secondly, this boy's heart was clearly impacted by this soldier's gesture of care, impacted enough to share with 2,000 children and students enough to tell his children and enough for me to know that his heart was changed at that moment. Even at the age of four, he understood that this man was doing something counter-cultural by extending a hand of compassion and care and overcoming any violent narratives and prejudices against ethnic Chinese that might have been rampant in the Japanese community at the time. You have to understand at that time, the Chinese and the Japanese, the relationship was completely fraught. But what I find most interesting of all is that all this Japanese man did in that one brief moment was to share his fish and dress some wounds. He did not continue on in his journey as would have probably been appropriate in that context, but like the good Samaritan, he stopped, he engaged, he attended to this boy's needs. This man shed all he had, one fried fish, in a breathtaking act of care and kindness. I would say a simple, ordinary, but radical act of compassion and care. I believe this is what we mean by sustainable peace building, don't you? To one seemingly unspectacular act of generosity, this Japanese man was able to offer a message of hope through the life of Francis. Through one fish, violent narratives concerning the Japanese and Chinese were challenged, and over 2,000 students across multiple generations were inspired to engage with their violent national history. And encouraged by his message of hope, knowing that they too can be messengers of peace, I believe these acts of courage and care are the core of what we want as peace builders. And it, it coming from a business perspective, I would say this is a huge return on investment. But what troubles me most about this story is that stories like this occupy so little space in academic research and peace policies. 
when we evaluate peace building projects, these stories don't usually feature in our reporting because how do we evaluate the impact of one fish? Sorry. Instead, we use the language of systemic violence, structural injustice, and institutional reform when we're talking peace building. And embedded in all this language is the understanding that sustainable peace and long lasting conflict transformation requires trust and respect or mutual understanding, dialogue and inclusion. But the, the word care is not given any precedence at all. And yet from Francis's um, story, care is at the heart of what we do as peace builders. Care is the core business of peace building, don't you think? So today I want to kind of return back to basics. 2020 has been a year of upheaval for, I'm sure for you, my family, it's been a great year of uh, upheaval. And so I've spent a lot of time in lockdown reflecting. And I've been reflecting, what is the core of peace building? In, in my discussion about peace intelligence, I want to put care at the heart and center of what we do. So that when we come to do our conflict mapping or when we're deciding whether to fund a particular project as donors, we ask ourselves, do we care? Do we care about this particular project? Do we care about this particular conflict? Do we care about the histories and politics and all the background context we need to understand before we, before we jump straight in and do our development work? For, for this rest of uh, the session, I want to propose a framework for peace and diligence that puts care at the center of it all. Uh, as was, uh, as Salma mentioned, mentioned, before, mentioned before, that one of my many hats is that I wear, that I wear is uh, I'm a cultural intelligence trainer. So I would like to use the cultural intelligence framework as a basis for exploring what we might understand by the term peace intelligence. I also think cultural intelligence is a pretty good basis to start, given that cultural intelligence is expressly about bridging conflict or bridging difference. So just briefly, what is cultural intelligence or CQ? Cultural intelligence is the capability to work and relate effectively across any number of different cultural contexts. It's not, it's not just something that applies to um, national and ethnic differences when we, like how we use the word culture na narrowly. It's actually, it's a uh, reference to the skill that we apply in our home country as well, as well as overseas at different organizations and even across generations which to me sounds like peace building. According to, cultural, uh, to the Cultural Intelligence Center, having CQ helps predict one's effectiveness at working across many different cultures and many, many different cultural contexts, whether national, ethnic, organizational, and generational. Talking to my peers and other cultural intelligence trainers, the most queries we get nowadays is not about how to deal with people of different ethnicities. It's actually about generational cultures. So cultural intelligence is also very relevant in that context. Now, if you've done enough cultural competency training, so you'll be familiar with this metaphor uh, that cultural trainers love to use when discussing culture and that they describe culture, it's like an iceberg where you see the top part human nature and human behavior. But often we don't see the bottom part, which is the cultural systems, norms, values, and assumptions. When we talk about CQ, it's important to try and, um, try and come to some level of understanding where we can make this less of the unknown and move it upwards. And so I just want to talk about and debunk some myths when we, people talk about cultural intelligence. The first myth is that the more international experience and more international travel you have, the more cultural intelligence you have. That's, a, that's a clearly a myth. Just because you have traveled overseas doesn't mean you have high cultural intelligence or appreciation of the intricacies of a culture. In fact, for some people, 
It might even entrench prejudices and stereotypes where you get annoyed with the local people and start making white general generalizations of the people. You say, oh, all these Chinese or the Indians or all these tourists, they always do this and this and this. So traveling doesn't necessarily mean you have cultural intelligence. A second myth is that high emotional intelligence equates to high cultural intelligence. Just because you have high emotional intelligence doesn't mean that you always act appropriately or respond co uh, correctly to the context. Here, I this is a photo, I find it very interesting. A photo of two women taking uh, a photo right in front of a disaster, it would seem to me. But due to the selfie culture, for some reason, the danger of the situation has somehow been lost on them. In the same way, I would suggest just because you have a high emotional intelligence doesn't mean you are comfortable with navigating across difference and conflict. It's, it's not the same, it's a different kind of skill. Despite these myths that high intel, uh, emotional intelligence equates to high cultural intelligence or that lots of traveling means you're good with culture, research shows that high international experience and high IQ, or sorry, EQ does not result in high CQ. Though I haven't looked into this specifically, I would suggest this is also the case for peace intelligence. And you only need to know in the development sector of development workers, uh, not always being on their best behavior. So as I noted earlier, I want to use the CQ framework as a basis for exploring what a PQ framework might be like or might look like. Uh, so my peace intelligence is a term I've made up. Uh, and uh, so this is just me kind of exploring with you. And I hope to be in conversation with you as we explore what a peace intelligence might look like. So research reveals that culturally intelligent people have strengths in four key capabilities here. CQ drive or cultural intelligence drive relates to motivation and interest or drive and confidence to adapt to a multicultural situation. So drive means your interest in learning about difference. CQ knowledge is about your understanding of how cultures are similar and different. For example, that Chinese in Singapore like to operate in a working situation that has a high level of certainty, whereas mainland Chinese are more comfortable with uncertainty. And when I was working in Beijing, you would have many instances where uh, large companies would send their uh, ethnic Chinese uh, from Singapore to mainland China thinking, oh, you're Chinese, you can speak Mandarin, you should be able to deal with the Beijing or, or the people from China. And often the Singaporeans would have a hard time, not because of language, but because the cultural divide is a lot wider than often assumed or understood. So cultural knowledge is important, but it is something that you can often uh, pick up by reading books, whereas compared to the others, uh, it requires a little bit more effort. So the third part of the drive and knowledge is action, your ability to adapt when relating and working interculturally. So this is your behavior. So after drive, knowledge and action, we have our fourth component, strategy. So strategy is your awareness and ability to plan for multicultural interactions. This is where coaching can actually be very helpful in preparing you to manage different types of scenarios. Due to time, I, I won't be examining these aspects in detail because my focus today isn't on so much on culture, but on peace building. But for the purposes of this talk, I suggest that this framework uh, might offer a useful springboard to explore what we might mean by peace intelligence. In fact, if you go back to the, the definition of cultural intelligence, it sounds very much like what we do as peace builders in bridging across difference, don't you think? Uh, if you go to definition, the capability to function effectively across various cultural contexts, national, ethnic, organizational, and generational. To me, that sounds like exactly the definition of peace building. So if we were to design a peace intelligence or PQ framework, which is about motivation and interest to adapt, um, if we were to design a framework uh, that translates 
uh, to the peace setting, I would suggest that drive would translate to an open posture and willingness to encounter difference. It's a motivation, it's an interest to engage with difference. So that's the motivation. In terms of knowledge, uh, this might relate to uh, knowledge about conflict settings. In peace building, we understand the value of local knowledge, and this is why we often encourage local ownership of the peace process and for external peace builders to play a facilitative role. We assume and we expect local peace builders to have a more accurate and richer appreciation of the context of the conflict, the histories, the politics that external peace builders um, might not have because we we implicitly recognize that knowledge is not just a matter of the mind where you could easily just pick up by reading a book. We, we understand that knowledge is also something of the subconsciousness and that knowledge can also manifest in the body. It's an embodied thing. It's not just a cognitive thing. A local peace, bo uh, a local peace builder's body might unconsciously respond to the conflict situations and this knowledge is built up over time and experience. But this does not mean we must romanticize what we call the local turn or local peace building. A local peace builder with low PQ drive may have little motivation to understand the particular context of the conflict. And they may wrongly assume, unfortunately wrongly assume that just because they are from the area, they have an accurate appreciation of the conflict. At the same time, an external peace builder with high PQ drive can actually compensate for their lack of knowledge. And uh, they may be good at what uh, John Paul Lederach calls web watching and observing the specific context of the conflict. Being, being aware that they know so little may compel them to school up on knowledge of, of the conflict. Um, one thing that I love in peace research, there's a project called the Everyday Peace Indicators. And this was uh, led by Roger McGinty and Pamina Furchow. And I, I think they have a book out on that too, Everyday Peace, peace Indicators. And they seek to understand how um, local peace, uh, local people understand peace and conflict rather than apply um, generic definitions of positive peace or universal metrics in evaluating peace projects. If you know the, the Global Peace Index, uh, they, they have a very defined understanding of positive peace, whereas the everyday peace indicators are more contextualized and they are very localized. The, the, their project is precisely based on the desire to increase our knowledge of how peace is understood in, the, in that specific locality. And it's also been very interesting if you read some of the descriptions. In some communities, peace is understood as not having your dog bark at the middle of the night because dog barking suggests an intruder. That's a very different definition from saying positive peace means good governance, democracy, human rights. It's, it's contextualized. So when combined with um, this knowledge with a high drive to understand a situation, we might actually be able to obtain more accurate knowledge of that specific context. So we've had a uh, drive, we've had knowledge. So PQ action. Uh, I use PQ action to refer to the ability to adapt and be responsive. In John Paul Ledrack's book, The Moral Imagination, he talks about having fluid platforms that respond to the context. This is a very different um, model from his earlier books and building piece, which he, he talks about structure, but he explicitly is trying to go uh, move on from that uh, structure to fluid platforms because he understands we need to be adaptive and respons responsive. So fluid platforms as in something that's not fixed, but something can, that can move. Um, we need this fluidity because we recognize the world is dynamic and so conflict is a moving feat. I mean, in, in the space of a few months, our lives have been so, have been, uh, are so drastically different from what it was last year. So we need to expect that conditions are changing. So PQ action takes this dynamic world into account and encourages us to be flexible. But because we might not have sufficient knowledge about a particular situation and not yet know how to respond and adapt intuitively, we do need an element of strategic 
thinking. This is the where we uh, the strategic component in peace intelligence. PQ strategy might refer to how we conduct uh, our conflict analysis, our conflict ma mapping, so that we are aware of the actors, behaviors, structural conditions that result in intractable conflict. We strategize because we recognize that we don't know everything about a conflict or a relationship, and we uh, and that sometimes we we might not know not intuitive know, know how to respond appropriately. And so an element of scenario planning is essential. So using a CQ framework, we've come up with four components in my uh, peace intelligence framework. We have drive, knowledge, action, and strategy. But is that enough? Based on my story, if you uh, were listening, you, hopefully you will agree it's not enough. What is missing from this framework? If we were to build a peace building framework that is based on peace intelligence, I believe we not only need to account for drive, knowledge, strategy, and action, but we need to put the call to care at the center of everything we do. So what is care? This is a, a word that um, I, I'm from an Asian family, so we don't use this word care in how we uh, socially engage with each other. So I say, I, I would suggest care is when we see the human in the other when we realize that our histories, our present, our future are all tied up together, no matter where we are based geographically. So COVID, through COVID, we've come to realize that one little virus that started in China suddenly has spread around the world and it's impacted us so intimately. And then Zoom, through Zoom, we're all highly connected. There are many things that are connecting us, climate change, and increasingly we are so highly interconnected and realizing that we are not just two people or two parties coexisting together, but that we are, that um, one person's well being is affected by the well being, being of the other. Care is when we see ourselves as part of the same web of relationship as another in what Martin Buber might call the I thou relationship, if you're familiar with his work. So why is care important? Well, in addition to the ability to make true heart change that can break through violent narratives, I believe care is the important grease, the grease for social relationships that help us to overlook minor infringements and offenses or political and ideological differences. So I have many, many disagreements with my husband and many disagreements with my extended family and friends. And that's okay because we know that we care. Ultimately, our relationship is based on care. Conflict is not bad as peace builders know. Conflict is neutral. And so we need something to help grease these relationships so that when conflict occurs, it's fine. So care is what Galtung might refer to as the reservoir of peace that we can draw on when things go wrong. It is the grace that we need to keep things moving. A posture of care is a, a very powerful thing and should not be underestimated, even if we can't measure it or see it. At the same time, I'm sure you know, it's very easy to detect if care is missing. Care is so hard to fake and it speaks through your body as much as through your words. So I have some guiding questions. I return back to this. And I find that's useful when we decide whether to intervene. Do we care? Do we care about this particular project? Do we care about this particular conflict? Do we care about the histories and the politics and the background context that we need to understand before we jump straight in and do our development work? Even if we don't have that level of care, should we care? Is there an ethical imperative on us to care in this very moment? Are we the best person to care about this situation? And does it matter if we're not? So, because if you do care, even the simple act of sharing fish can change the whole dynamic for the better. So if we're gonna put care at the center of a peace intelligence framework, I believe it would look a little bit like this. So not the most sophisticated web image, image of a spider web, 
but uh, by bringing together John Paul Le uh, Lederach's web of relationship model, we can see that care is at the center of the web. But uh, even though this is not a very sophisticated web image, the point is that peace intelligence is anchored at the four points of drive, knowledge, action, and strategy. It anchors us. And everything is interconnected by these little webs, which represent relationships. This means that the emphasis shouldn't be on individual peace intelligence, but on the collective pool of knowledge, drive, action, and strategy. Your collective pool, meaning your pool in your organization, your family, your community, and that, that connects us all in this web of relationships, all these little strands. And at the heart of this is care. Care keeps relationships still bound together. When one aspect, for example, knowledge is broken, if this part of the web breaks or is missing, the web is still held, held together to the center, the care, the reservoir of care. So I started this talk describing a moment of care in the context of war. And I want to end with a story that is very mundane and um, ordinary because peace intelligence is needed in all settings. I was 13 when I first moved to Geneva. I was a young, socially awkward Malaysian girl and I couldn't speak the lo local language. It was the first time my family had ever been in Europe and my parents were equally overwhelmed by culture shock. I remember when we were sitting on the harbour of Geneva looking at the ducks and thinking, gosh, is anyone going to catch that duck and cook it? What is the duck doing there? And so we were totally not used to the setting. And uh, I attended a school where I knew no one and for half a year I had no friends. And uh, one day I was sitting having lunch and a 13 year old Swiss boy called Daniel, 13 year old as well, he noticed me sitting by myself during the lunch break and he approached me. In very limited English, he invited me to join him and his friends for lunch. None of his friends spoke English, and I'm sure his friends all felt as equally awkward as I did in that moment because I didn't speak French or German. Nevertheless, some tried to share smiles and nods and indicate that I was welcome. The, the girls in the group make an extra effort in their body posture and their facial expressions to make clear that I was valued. Now, I don't actually know any of these people's names anymore, and I, I I haven't remained in contact with them since I've returned to Malaysia, but through that one moment of care, something in my heart broke. It's, it's somehow connected with my innermost part of my soul in that moment. In 13-year-old Daniel's eyes, all he did was just be friendly. A few years ago, I managed to find Daniel on Facebook and reconnect with him. And I told him about how his one moment of uh, act of care made all the difference to me. And he said he had no recollection whatsoever of that moment. And uh, I have no doubt that it was just part of his normal everyday practice. But because of that act of care to a stranger, his choice to not be apathetic and just do what he normally does, I have realized that I have value and that others have value too. And since then, I remember, even though at that 30, um, I was 13 years old, so I, I made almost this oath under my breath and I said, I am never going to let anyone feel marginalized and unnoticed if I am in the room. I am going to try and be the, if no one goes up to them, I want to be that person who says hello and to make sure that they are not left out. That was the first seed that led me towards Peace building, my journey towards peace building began when I was 13. My story is very ordinary, but nevertheless personal and transformative. And I have no doubt that you have your own stories of how care transformed something in you or in a conflict setting. So I want to hear those stories. I want to take some time now to hear some of your own stories. Um, we will take 20 minutes in breakout rooms and I hope you stay for this uh, because uh, I'm in the company of peace builders and facilitators we have we are going to self-organize we don't have facilitators organizing the breakout groups but I hope that in your group setting we'll be able to discuss these questions 
And these are three questions. What stories do you have where care led you or someone along a path towards peace building? or led you, to, uh, led you to transform conflict or transform the setting of conflict. Second question, is there a value in promoting the idea of peace intelligence? And I will be offended if you say, no, there's absolutely no value. This contributes nothing. I'm happy to hear those points as well. Third is what other things should be included in the framework for peace intelligence? So if you say, if you're thinking, gosh, you've missed a completely important part to this framework, please share, because this is an exploration that we're doing together. So after 20 minutes, um, the tech will bring you back and we will uh, have a debrief. I'd like to hear some stories. If you feel like you don't want to share verbally, when you come back, feel free to post in the group chat and uh, I'll read that. But I really would like to hear your personal stories. As you, as you heard, it, it doesn't need to be in the context of war or a spectacular. It can be in the mundane and everyday as long as it made a change in your life. And I want to hear those stories. And um, after 10, 15 minutes, depending on time, then Lu Lucy will facilitate a Q&A for a few minutes. How does that sound? So I'll stop. I'll stop the screen share and I'll post these questions in the box for you to um, discuss. So we're going to go into our groups now and uh, please do share your stories. Hand it to you, Christina. Just a second, sorry. Well, I, I heard that there was some very uh, good stories, but, and I was really sad to have to leave and not hearing all of them. So could uh, maybe Grant's group, maybe would you be willing to share? I know you guys had some, some stuff you wanted to discuss. So. Yes. Hello, everyone. So uh, I will be reporting for the Blue Group. Uh, I have to say it was a very interesting discussion and we had representatives from London, from Australia, from Italy, from Ireland and from Serbia. So we shared the examples uh, as part of the first question, but uh, what we came as a joint conclusion is that care and the connection are some, some, somehow embodied naturally in ourselves, not only as peace builders, but uh, for example, Grant is a paramedic, so he was talking about the connection when healing people, when, when uh, res rescuing the people in need, you have to feel it in order to have the impact. Uh, Eamon from Ireland was mentioning that sometimes it is uh, difficult uh, uh, in the political situations and uh, post-conflict situations, it's uh, difficult to, sh uh, to show the care for the suffering of the others but we have to somehow transcend it. And uh, this is something that uh, we, uh, we came across as, as a joint uh, feeling of everyone in the group. And uh, we were talking about disadvantages actually of this work that we are doing nowadays through the online platforms. But again, we uh, shared that it's important to be there to be there as and to to just to 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 listen and to feel the compassion, even though you cannot have live encounters, live meetings with the others, it is in a way limited for the peace builders and peace educators. But in any way, it connects us all. Like today, you know, we have forty people from fifteen at least countries or, or regions, and. Uh, there is no replacement to uh, live meetings with the people, but again, we have to do what we can at the time being. And uh, Sabrina was mentioning uh, about the embodied component uh, where we have to also take care of the, of the resilience of the body of peace builders. So 
if you can, uh, Sabrina, if you can add to, to our thoughts and anyone else from the group. Um, yeah, no, my last, uh, hi everyone, everyone. The, that last point was, um, I, I think we made this trend, uh, this conversation, which was really interesting about um, the, you know, the Zoom platform and how it opens this door of connection but also how we miss um, what we're presenting through our bodies uh, quite a lot. Uh, and I think it's an interesting maybe time to, to be receiving with our bodies, if that makes sense, but we're not really emitting as much because there's, there's a limit. And then I, I, we were just uh, interested in whether the, the peace intelligence framework could, could include the building resilience uh, in the body uh, in order to allow the care to, to flourish um, while, while maintaining a kind of equanimity. Um, so that was our, yeah. Great, thank you. Discussed. Um, Bambi's group, I recall that you were just, uh, Hannah, you guys were coming up with some stories. Do you have anything that you wanted to share? I'm just putting you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, Stella, would you like to share instead of me? Stella? Stella, you see her? Oh, okay. Before we start, would you like to add something? Or, okay, I think I, I, I'll just uh, summarize. So, or maybe um, just share your story. I think that was very interesting. Firstly, uh, the, the breakout session was really interesting. It, we, although we belong to different parts of the world, but uh, you know, our, our care, our passion towards uh, peace building was something that uh, really uh, made us uh, feel comfortable to share our stories. So uh, what we all really agreed upon was uh, how, how like in, in the, daily world where crisis is rising, there are wars everywhere. So the need to uh, practice peace intelligence and peace building is a must in today's world. So that was something we uh, all agreed upon. Uh, talking about my personal story, uh, how, uh, how um, my uh, care or commitment led towards this field of peace building, it all started when I was in bachelor's. And um, I, I had a friend who, who is visually impaired. So we were really close and we used to go to events together um, and we really shared uh, our heart out and you know talked about anything and everything. So while we used to go to the events, he used to say, uh, tell me that Stella, when I'm with you, I feel I can uh, explore the world, I can see the world. So it doesn't feel like I am a disabled person. I don't think that, uh, that I'm not able to see the world. I, I, I don't feel regret about that when I'm with you. So um, that, that, that was a very uh, emotional point for me because uh, I, I genuinely loved him and uh, talking as, as a person who loves talking, I always used to tell him stories, whatever I'm seeing on the road or whatever happening, whatever is happening in the events. So that, uh, that point made me very emotional and it gave me a motivation to do something for uh, people like him who are not able to you know, see, see the world. So, um, sorry, I, I just uh, I felt a little over, overwhelmed. Uh, so uh, that moment led me to do something for people with disability. And um, uh, I, I am a volunteer at uh, an NGO called Global Peace Foundation Nepal. And uh, through that platform, I got an opportunity to conduct a mini project. So my project is dedicated towards uh, people with visual impairment here in Nepal. Um, so we, we are doing uh, leadership development programs for them so that uh, they do not feel left behind. Uh, and uh, the, the project will kick off very soon. And I really hope uh, if, if we all can collaborate in any way, that would be of great help. So yeah, th that is one of the uh, personal stories that I'd like Thank to share. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry you, if I exceeded the time limit. <laughs> no, that's right. So I, I'd like to take one more story. And if, um, if you have one, please do share. Uh, otherwise, share your comments. Uh, 
and uh, questions even or stories on the chat box. I'd love to hear. Does anyone have a story? If not, we will probably end this component in, in the, one of the other groups that hasn't spoken. What color was that? Uh, I'm Matthew? Very used to Matthew, is it? Nasia, you had a nice story, no? Please, I'm, you I'm share. Here. This is well, a gossip. Yes, this I is like, yeah, go ahead. Hello. I shared a story that happened to me many years ago. It's a very interesting experience. I went to Los Angeles, um, Southern California University, uh, many, many years ago from Bangladesh. And at that time, I used to wear saris. So I was easily identifiable as a kind of alien. <laughs> and so when I went there, and I was going through a bad patch in my life, personally, uh, in terms of the relationship. And I needed some time to think about uh, various things and plan for the future. I went to a nearby park and I was surrounded by a group of very big people, very large men. They were also young and they wanted money from me, uh, claiming that they were from Biafra and they needed money to uh, deal with some of the civil war situation. Um, and I had my bag with me, a uh, handbag and their eyes were on the bag and since i was alone so they almost surrounded me and i was terribly frightened and at that time i didn't know how to save myself that i thought they were going to take me away assault me snatch my bag and suddenly a gentleman appeared at the scene uh, from nowhere and he was also small not like those big people and he came to me saying that uh, you want to go home don't you and I said, yes, please. <laughs> and I got up and he just led me away. And funnily enough, those big people just melted away, disappeared as soon as this young uh, gentleman came uh, to me. And he took me to my place. And at that time, I lived in a place near the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, in an apartment. And it, the street didn't have a name. So I just told him 23rd or 25th or whatever street uh, it was. And on the way, he was asking me who I was, what I was, and where I was from. I said I was from Bangladesh and very new. And he said, I, I uh, realized you were very new. Otherwise, uh, as a woman, you shouldn't have, you wouldn't have go, gone to that park because no young women will go to that park alone. Uh, and I said, oh, my God, I didn't know that. And he said, they were after your money and never come here alone again because it's not safe. And then he said, what are you? What is your religion? So I said, I am a Muslim. And he said, I am Jewish. So we had a good conversation on the way. And uh, later on, when he went away, it was such an act of kindness from a stranger. I always thought that he saved my life. I could have been kidnapped. I could have been murdered. Who knows? But the point is that courage that he showed, showed us, a, a, a thin, thin um, skeletal gentleman coming to face this huge group, group of huge men and save a woman like that. That was tremendous uh, experience and that gave me the courage to speak to strangers in the, afterwards. You know, I, I was quite shy at that time, couldn't speak to strangers. But I thought, if we translate that compassion for other people in other areas of our lives, uh, locally, nationally, internationally, what we can achieve, it's unbelievable what we can achieve. And when I actually, in the, in the later years of my life, when I looked at some of these conflicts going on or prejudices going on against Muslims, uh, against anti-Semitic, uh, anti things that are happening. I always give this example to those people that why do you do that? Individually, we are so different and so so alike at the same time. And we can resolve the conflicts of the world through compassion. If we translate this in a corporate way, our big challenges of the world, 
will be will be actually solved. If you look at climate change, if you look at uh, pandemic, what is happening, we are interconnected. For heaven's sake, just put compassion in the middle of everything. We will solve it. And I'm very optimistic we will one day solve all these things. Thank you. That's an amazing, amazing story. Uh, thank you for sharing that. that was a very difficult moment, I'm sure, in your life uh, and a very intimate story. And, and I, I like the point that uh, Dragana's uh, group raised is that uh, this element of responsibility, and which is why I use this web model. We are all interconnected. And when you realize that our lives are interconnected because of climate change, environment, food security, food insecurity, global pandemics, when we realize that we are so interconnected, this makes us understand we have a responsibility to each other, not just our family and a community, but how I choose to eat or what I buy will impact on another country because of trade. And, and we, we've learned through so many stories in the last few years, you know, with Greta Thunberg, you know, or Joshua Wong, all these young people, one person, you say, well, what can one person do? Well, everyone who made change was one person. And so when we realize that um, our lives are interconnected and we have this responsibility, it, it then requires this act of care, isn't it? And I, I'm just so encouraged by your stories. Well, we are going to close off soon, uh, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take it in the next few, two, three, four minutes that we have or so. so five minutes so if you do otherwise um i'll pass the session back to lucy well, lucy you can uh, moderate the rest of this uh q a well i i think it actually worked so well with those breakout groups but i'm looking hopefully in the chat in case there are questions this is your opportunity to to ask a question from elaine who uh I wonder what you think you could add. Did any of you get to discussing, for instance, what what could be added to that peace framework, to that amazing web of interconnections that uh, I think we all feel. I think we wouldn't be here today if we didn't feel this this profound connection and need to to connect with other people working in this field. Do any of you have questions around that? How have you thought? How would you actually work with what Elaine has talked about? How what can you do with it? Are there questions you would like to ask her about that? You can you can raise a hand or put in the chat. Maybe, maybe it's overwhelming all the, the stories. <laughs> I, I, I think that. Yes, um, go I ahead. I just wanted to reassure Elaine that plenty of people across the world exist who believe in what you are doing because we are doing similar things. So we are interconnected spiritually uh, through actions, through our philosophy of life, and that is compassion and care. Care is in the middle of all of these things that are uh, that is driving us. And on the 20th of December, uh, because I chair United Nations Association Newton branch, I do all kinds of things which will bring people together on a platform and link them towards solving problems collectively. And on the 20th of December, I am uh, marking the um, uh, Human Solid International Human Solidarity Day. And that is absolutely underpinned by care and compassion. We need that solidarity across the board to resolve challenges that we face as, uh, as human beings. Uh, and peace, building peace, is our aim. In 1945, when the United Nations uh, was founded, that was the aim. No more war, no more conflict. There should be peace. And how do we do it without, without solidarity? So what you have said is exactly right. We should put care and compassion in the center so that whatever we do, whatever paradigm we develop, whatever project we develop, the driving force will be compassion and care. And I absolutely believe in that. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So there is an International Solidarity Day on December the 20th. Yes. That's yes. actually very good to know. I wasn't aware of that. Shall I invite it's, all it's, of you through, I can invite all of you through Salma because I, I am connected with Salma now. Okay, uh, yes, please. It's, it's a day I know many people I care about who have birthdays on that day. So it fits <laughs> very well with uh, international solidarity. That's, that's maybe a good note on which to end, because all I see through the chat is lots of interesting comments, endorsement, a lovely Hindu Sanskrit, um, I, I won't say it right, Vasudaiva Kutumbakam, which means we all belong to one human family. This is, this is beautiful. And maybe, Elaine, I should give you the last words and then let Selma, Selma close with a final thank you. But thank you all from me for, for wonderful stories, really, really interesting discussions. Elaine, that was fantastic, as I knew it would be. Christina, thank you for being there and making it all work. You very modestly there, but thank you so much. And Selma, thank you for organizing and bringing us Elaine and, and this amazing and inspiring webinar. Thank you so much, all of you. Yeah, thank you. Now I've been inspired by the stories uh, that I've heard in the different groups and it just shows me that we need to start talking about these, these moments more with strangers and with people and uh, say, how, what is your story? What, what is that story that changed your life? Because it's just, it's, it's not about the, your brain. It's not, when I say intelligence, it's not about the brain, it's something else. It's, it's about the body, it's the heart that's connecting, right? So uh, if we want sustainable change and sustainable peace, we need to connect at that level. So thank you for sharing with me. I really enjoyed this time to, to connect with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. I hope uh, you are as inspired and moved as I am. Uh, there was a lot of sharing, a lot of exchange. A lot of emotions would have come up for many of us. We were talking about care. And um, as I was saying in my group, it's a good time to reflect on this topic since it's been a tough year for all of us and for the whole world with the pandemic. So it's the end of the year. It's a good time to be in reflection and a good topic to close with. Um, I will not summarize um, or some, uh, go into a summation of Elaine's presentation, but I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts that struck me from Elaine's um, presentation. And hopefully you will be taking them back with you as I will too. Uh, Elaine mentioned that what we need is to develop an open posture to engage with what's different. An open posture to engage with what's different. So difference is what very often leads to conflict, the way we respond to difference, the way we other as a result of difference. So dealing and facing difference with an open posture will be what a caring approach asks for. Then when we all um, engage in peace building work and programs and projects, the guiding questions we need to ask ourselves and our teams and the people we work with are, do we care? Do we care about this conflict? Do we really care about this project? Do we care and how much do we care about making peace in this conflict? And also it was really, really enlightening for me to hear when Elaine said that conflict is not a bad thing. Conflict should be viewed as neutral. And this is critical because only if we view it as neutral would we be able to engage in hope of a better tomorrow. Because if we view it as a bad or a difficult thing, we will not be able to move forward. So viewing it as neutral will help us to come out of it and what was beautiful, I will end with this, is how Elaine described the notion of care. She mentioned care is when we see the human in the other. It is the reservoir of peace when things go wrong. So with that, I wish you all a wonderful, peaceful evening and a wonderful end of the year. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.